17 paper 2. Uh, we've got a gravimeter, a instrument used to measure accelerated use of gravity uh, using a free falling mirror. And we use monochromatic light that is reflected, and we have interference between the incident and the reflected waves. So the mirror is released from rest and causes a change in the phase difference between the incident and reflected waves at a detector. At the point of release of the mirror, the waves are in phase, resulting in a maximum intensity. The next maximum is reduced at the detector when the mirror has fallen through a distance equal to half a wavelength of the light. The gravimeter records the number of maxima detected in a known time as the mirror falls, and the data can then be used to calculate acceleration. So um, here is a figure showing the uh, instant wave and the reflected one. Uh, so you can see that the reflected wave is trailing the incident wave by 0 0.04 times 10 to the minus 14 seconds. Okay, so first thing, show the wavelength is 600 nanometers. Well, from the diagram, we can figure out what the time period is and therefore the frequency. And then from the frequency, we can figure out the wavelength is 6 times 10 to minus 7, which is 600 nanometers. So determine the phase difference in radians between the instant and reflected waves. So as I noted earlier, the time difference between them is uh, 0.04 times 10 to minus 14. So if we express that as a fraction of the whole time period, we can see that's the fifth of one time period. So then the phase difference is going to be a fifth of 2 pi, which is 1.3 radians. So a maximum is detected each time the mirror travels a distance equal to half a wavelength. In one measurement, there are 2.37 times 10 to the 5 maxima, um, as the mirror is released from rest and falls for 0 0.120 seconds. Using an appropriate equation of motion, calculate the acceleration due to gravity, giving your answer to three significant figures. So, um, because the distance between a ma each maxima equates to um, half a wavelength, what I did is I multiplied the number of maxima by half a wavelength to get the distance fallen, and then divided that by time squared, giving us 9.88 meters per second squared. Okay, so the graph uh, for the figure 10 is the graph of the gravimeter would produce to show how the distance traveled varies with time as it falls. And we've got distance in meters, time in milliseconds. Okay, so determine the gradient of the line when the time is 0.12 seconds. Uh, so to do the gradient of a curve, you draw a tangent at that point, so at 120 milliseconds. And then in terms of determining the gradient, uh, we want change in y over change in x of that line, giving us 0.00118. State what the gradient represents. Well, it's a displacement time graph, so it's going to be the velocity of the mirror at that specific moment in time. Okay, so now we've got an ion propulsion unit used on spacecraft launched in 1998. Atoms of xenon-131 are injected from a storage tank into a chamber where they became ionized due to collisions with electrons. A negatively charged grid attracted the xenon ions, accelerating them out of the back of the ion propulsion unit, causing the spacecraft to be propelled forwards. So by accelerating the ions one way, the spacecraft is propelled the other way, essentially. So the mass of a xenon plus ion is 2.18 times 10 to minus 25. Calculate the specific charge of a xenon plus ion. Um, so specific charge, the word specific means per unit mass. So specific charge is going to be the charge divided by the mass, giving us a 7.3 times 10 to the 5 coulombs per kilogram. So the storage tank contained 79 kilograms of xenon. When the ion propulsion unit was switched on, it had an average power of 2.1 kilowatts. Each xenon ion gained 1,300 electron volts of energy as it was accelerated and ejected out the propulsion unit. Calculate the energy in joules gained by each xenon ion. So we just need to convert from electron volts to joules using this conversion factor. Fairly straightforward. Determine the length of time the ion propulsion unit operated before all of the 79 kilograms of xenon was used up. 
Okay, so the first thing I did was figure out how many xenon ions there are by dividing the 79 kilograms by the mass of one atom. And then what I did is I figured out how many ions per second were being lost by dividing the power by the energy per xenon ion. And then once we've got those two, we can figure out the time by dividing those two to give us 3.59 times 10 to the 7 seconds, so a pretty long period of time. So an ion propulsion unit could use helium ions instead of xenon ions. An ion of helium-4 has a much higher specific charge than uh, xenon-131, but both ions would gain uh, 1,300 electron volts of kinetic energy in being accelerated and ejected from the ion propulsion unit. So they've got the same kinetic energy. Suggest whether the helium ions or xenon ions are better used as the repellent in future space programs. Your answer should compare the relative speeds and momentum changes of the ions. Okay, so the, in terms of providing a big force forward, the thing that matters is the rate of change momentum of the whatever ion we're using. So, um, although so the kinetic energies are the same, the speed of the helium atom would be lot or ion would be larger, but its mass is much less. So if we actually look at how we convert from kinetic energy to momentum, which is what's going to be important, we can see that the momentum is calculated by multiplying the kinetic energy by two times the mass. So having a much smaller mass is going to mean a much smaller momentum, and that's the issue. So even though the kinetic energy is the same, smaller mass means smaller momentum. So there's a smaller momentum change per second occurring in the engine, which would mean there's less thrust forward, and that completes this section.